morning, I invite you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. That's the passage that we just heard sung in Handel's Messiah here just a moment ago. Unto us a child is born. By the way, that's on page 489 if you'd like to follow along in the Bible in the seat rack in front of you. As this morning, we're starting a special three-week series entitled Joys, like we see here on the, on the piano. Joys. Now that stands this morning for, for this little message, Jesus offers you salvation. And each Sunday, what we're going to do is take a different letter or set of letters from that word joys, and we're going to talk about it. Today, we want to talk about the letter J and some of the special qualities or titles of Jesus. And then next week, we're going to look at those words, offers you. And we're going to look at some of the offers that the world makes to us, and it'd be really easy to fall for those and then the genuine offer that Jesus makes. And then on that Sunday before Christmas, we're looking at the letter S, salvation. And we're going to unwrap and examine that gift of salvation. Look a little closer at it, and I think you're going to discover some gifts, some things about that gift that you may not have been aware of before. Well, Christmas time, of course, is a time for gifts. Uh, How many of you are all done with your Christmas shopping, and you're just one, two hands, oh, You people just annoy me so much. You know what I'm saying? Oh, man, you know? Well, if you're like me, you know, you may have noticed if you've been shopping for kids or grandkids, walking through the toy stores or down the toy sections, when you see all the toys they have now, it can just be kind of overwhelming. In fact, I found a a funny little piece this week. I, I think it was by a frustrated mother. That's, that's who she had to be. Her name was Tammy Rosenfeld. And she wrote about her kids this way, a little piece called Top Eight Reasons Why My Children Do Not Need More Toys. All right? I thought this was really good. In fact, you mothers might identify with these. Uh, reason number eight, it goes like this. They started off as babies who found my Tupperware drawer full of plastic containers and kitchen items much more fascinating than their toy bots. You know? Ever see that in the kitchen? They're opening it up and pulling it out. Number seven, the days I change the paper towel roll in the kitchen brings great excitement as they claim their new sword or telescope. Number six, their current toys are only exciting when I either reorganize them, put them neatly away, or when I start my garage sale pile. Mom, what are you doing, you know? Number five, who needs toys when jumping on my bed like the five little monkeys brings shouts of laughter. Number four, to make one of them want to play with a toy they already have, all I have to do is give it to the other child, and suddenly that toy becomes the best thing in the whole entire world. And then I like number three, it says, the days I mop the kitchen floor and move the chairs into the living room are cause for adventure as they build tents and dark Dark rooms, so exciting. Number two, a flashlight brings amusement to all my kids for hours. Kids love flashlights. And then number one, this was her personal favorite. The other day, they literally fought over who got to play with the fly swatter. I really wish I was kidding, you know. Wasn't that true about kids? You know, they just, they can find things to play with and have toys, and and that's one of the the wonderful things. Kids are funny things, you know, and as we think about gifts this season, we know, of course, the most precious gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we want to talk about joys, and that first letter, J, for Jesus, and some of the unique titles that the Bible gives him. In fact, we want to look at one of the most significant Old Testament passages, 700 years before Christ was born, that talked about his titles. Let's read Isaiah 9, 6. The word of God tells us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, if some of you know, and just about six weeks, my wife and I are planning the celebrating of another birth, the birth of another child. In fact, we recently found out it's going to be a baby boy. And I got to tell you, the pregnancy is going well. We are so excited. In fact, even at our age, this is probably the easiest pregnancy uh, that my wife and I have ever experienced. Because as some of you know, it's the birth of our first grandchild, okay? Got you a little worried there for a minute, you know. 
Well, I am told it's even more exciting when you have your grandchildren than your own <laughs> children. But you know, either way you look at it, the birth of a baby is an exciting event. Back, back in Bible times in Israel, it was extra special when a couple had their firstborn son. That's just the way the culture was uh, because the son was the one who would carry on the family name and the responsibilities. Well, eight days after a son was born, he was taken to the rabbi where he was circumcised and consecrated. And it would be at that time that the baby would be formally named. That name that was given was usually meant to say something about that son, maybe a character quality or something else. Well, God gave his son a very special name even before he was born. The angel of the Lord told Joseph, the fiancé of the Mary, these words, uh, in the next slide, Matthew 1.21. There we go. It said, She, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now, like we talked about before, that name Jesus is a very special name. In Hebrew, it is the word Yeshua. I want you to say that with me. Yeshua. Notice how it just kind of flows off your lips. Yeshua. That's the Hebrew name for Jesus. And Yeshua means, quite simply, God saves. God saves. Every time people spoke Jesus' name, Yeshua, they were proclaiming the reason that he came to earth, to save his people from their sins. That was his name. That's why he came, to save us from our sins and give us a new future and hope. What's interesting, though, is like I said before, about 700 years before Jesus came to earth, God revealed to the prophet Isaiah that Jesus would have four other titles that described him. And each one of those titles pointed to some quality that Jesus, God's son, would possess. And these titles reveal something about him, and they have extra special meaning to each one of us here today. So this morning, I want to look at each one of these names, these titles, so that hopefully we'll understand just a little bit more who that baby in the manger really was. The first name we read about, God's Son, Jesus Christ, is it says he will be called what? Wonderful Counselor. That word wonderful, Pele in the Hebrew, is most often used of God. And it means astonishing or miraculous or something that's just so amazing. It is literally beyond description. Something no mortal man could do, but Jesus alone can do. He is called wonderful. And then he is called counselor. That's ya'atz, the word in Hebrew. And it refers to somebody who is a guide, who gives advice, who makes plans and establishes purposes. Jesus is that wonderful, miraculous, amazing counselor and guide who guides us in his wonderful plans and his purposes for us. We well, you know, my friends, yesterday was a very significant day for me. I celebrated 38 years uh, a 38-year birthday. Can you believe that? I turned 38 yesterday. Do I look like a 38-year-old? You're going, Pastor Mike, you look great. That's right. Yesterday, I turned 38. Yesterday was a very special birthday for me. It was not celebrating the day I was born, but the day that I was born again. Yesterday, on December 5th, 1977, as a freshman in college, I gave my life to Christ. And he saved me from my sins, and he washed me, and he's been changing and sanctifying me to be more like him every day. We know I've discovered in 38 years that even when I've been stubborn and uncooperative, God has been so patient. And I have learned sometimes the hard way just how true Jesus, who is my Lord, really is a wonderful counselor. Well, I tell you, I have had lots of talks with Jesus over these last 38 years. And I've noticed something about those talks with my wonderful counselor. I found that when I'm really happy and joyous, I have some great times talking with the Lord, sharing. You know, just a wonderful time. But when I really sense my heart is in tune with the Lord, and, and when I have those, those, those really close conversations with my wonderful counselor, is when I have a deep need. Or when there's a hurt or I feel like I'm going through a crisis. There, there's something about those times when I'm pouring out my heart and sharing with the Lord that he is so close. You know, pain can do that to us. C.S. Lewis wrote these words. He says, we can ignore pleasure 
but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Now, people say to me sometimes, well, well Mike, that's great that, that Jesus is called the wonderful counselor, but, but how do you get counsel from him? How, how does he guide you? How does he speak to you? How, how does he give you that, that wonderful counsel? I'd like to have that. But you know what I've learned? To connect with my wonderful counselor, there's a couple things that I have to do. The first key is I have to make the time. I've got to shut off the phone. I've got to turn off the computer and the TV. And I have to go to him, just like you would any counselor. And then I have to tell him what's on my heart. What's troubling me? And this is really important. After I do, then I've got to wait for his answer. Because he always does answer if we're willing to wait. You know, sometimes when I need counsel from the Lord, I, what I'll do is I'll just lay the whole situation out before him part by part. You know, it reminds me of a story years ago when I was a little boy. I found an old broken wind-up alarm clock. Anybody remember those, you know? Uh, well, my parents decided to let me take this old broken uh, alarm clock apart because I said I wanted to fix it. Well, as I took it apart, you know, it had all these neat sprockets and springs and gears, even had a little bell. I mean, it was so cool. It was so fun and intricate taking it apart. But you won't believe this. Once I had it all apart, I had no idea how to get it back together again, you know? So I just threw all these parts into a great big box, and I just kind of left them there. We know, my friends, sometimes in our lives, we've got boxes in our lives full of all kinds of little broken pieces and parts. Sometimes the best thing you can do if you want to connect with your wonderful counselor is just dump all those pieces out in front of the cross. Pick up each one and explain them to the Lord. God, here are the parts. Here's this one. Here's the other thing that's going on. You know, I've found that, you know, sometimes when I'll do that, just talk with them piece by piece, part by part, about the things that are going wrong, that God just has a way by his Holy Spirit just to start filling my mind with thoughts and ideas of what to do and the next step to take. At other times, the, the wonderful counselor uh, will guide me to, to his word, where he'll speak to me from that. Or maybe somebody who's a wise, godly person who's been walking with them for years, listening to their wise counsel. But the key, my friends, to hearing from the wonderful counselor is you have to want to hear his answer. You have to seek him. You have to wait for what he has to say. But you have to be willing in your heart to do what he tells you to do. Because Jesus is a wonderful counselor. And that means that he not only gives wonderful counsel, but his purposes for our life, his plans, they're wonderful. And if you think about it, you know the best planner in all the universe is God. No one else does a better job of, of planning, especially for his people. And Jeremiah told us these words in Jeremiah 29. He said, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now, it doesn't mean that God's plans are always easy. It doesn't mean you're going to have trials or some tears. But God's plans for you are good. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the wonderful guide. And my friends, I'll tell you that this morning, not only does Jesus have wonderful plans, wonderful counsel for you, but he also has the power to accomplish those. That's what's neat about our wonderful counselor. And that brings us to the second thing we learn about Jesus this morning. He is called the mighty God, the mighty God. God. Remember what Isaiah wrote in this next slide? He says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shame shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Now when I was growing up, my first images of Jesus looked something like this in this next slide. You know, a very gentle, kind Jesus. Here he is, a loving Savior, taking care of the lambs. Or like this next slide, you know, here's Jesus with the children, so gentle, walking around the hillsides of Galilee. Well, we know that Jesus is very gentle because he came to seek and to save that which is lost. But in our passage this morning, he is also called the mighty God. 
And the word here for mighty in the Hebrew is the word gehobore. It's a military term, and it's used to describe a conquering king or a warrior or a champion. The word for God, we have mighty, but the word for God is the Hebrew word El, which talks about God in his strength. Jesus is the mighty God. And my friends, Jesus is coming back. In fact, in this next slide, it tells us he is coming back in the clouds, and every eye will see him. Now, we talked about that mighty God, Jesus, and what he's going to be like when he comes back when we looked in our Revelation series. And we learn when he does come back, he's going to come as a conquering king, bringing victory and judgment on sin. And he's going to establish a new earthly millennial kingdom. And it says the government will be on his shoulders. Now, we have lots of governments in our world today. In fact, uh, anybody know how many countries and governments are in our world? Anybody have a guess? Too many. That's probably true, all right? No, no peeking on your iPhone. I see, oh, come on, fly over there. All right. 196 countries. 196, if you include Taiwan. And I'll tell you, my friends, we have all kinds of huge countries, like in this one, the United States, 50 states. You go east to there, and of course, then you have Russia, you know, this massive country. And you also have very small countries. Some of them are about the size of Salem. One of them is the little country of Liechtenstein there. It's a little principality that's only about 25 kilometers long, located in the Alps between Austria and Switzerland. In fact, I discovered this week that, that Liechtenstein is so small that they've decided for just $75,000 a night, you can actually rent the country of Liechtenstein. <laughs> yeah. In fact, not only when you rent it, uh, they, will, they will create customized street signs, give you a night in the castle, and they will even have a temporary currency in your honor, you know. 75000 such a deal, you know, for the person that has everything. Well, some countries are very small. Some are very poor. One of the poorest is Sierra Leone, one of the very poorest countries. Other countries, as we know, have political unrest and terrorists. Some are corrupt. Some are very rich, like the United Arab Emirates. This is the city of Dubai, built with, with Middle Eastern oil. Very rich. But one thing you learn as you look at every one of those countries is that every one of them has challenges. Every one of them has problems. In fact, we think of our own country. Things get bogged down and bills, they get delayed. As you think about it, you think, wow, it, it would be hard for one person to just run one of those countries, let alone all 96, 196. But when Jesus returns, the Bible tells us he's going to run it all. All the nations, all the kingdoms, all the governments will be on his shoulders. He is the mighty God. And when he comes, the Bible tells us justice is going to reign. Peace is going to abound. There's going to be no more oppression or strife. And at that time, the prophecy that John gave us in Revelation will come true. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now let me ask you this. If the government of the world will be on his shoulders with all the challenges and problems, and Jesus is going to rule and reign as the mighty God, do you think... He has the power and the wisdom to guide the elements of your life. You know? I mean, if he can operate kings and kingdoms, and my friends, and even the affairs of the universe, is he big enough and is he powerful enough to deal with that problem that you're facing today? Can, can, can you go to him and just say, Lord, I want to take all the weight and burden and worry of this problem from my shoulders, and I want to put it on your shoulders? And I'm going to trust that with you bearing it, it's not going to be too much for me to handle because you are the mighty God. You see, my friends, the greatest thing that Jesus ever did was to save you from your sin, to go to the cross and to purchase your salvation. Anything else is small by comparison. It was the greatest and the most amazing and the most awesome thing that Jesus could ever do. And that demonstrated his power. He is, my friends, the mighty God, the mighty God. 
And that brings us to the third title this morning, number three. He is called the Everlasting Father. Years ago, a man shared that he and his wife were leaving our church to go to another church. And this other church that they wanted to go to, the reason they were going there was because it, it venerated and honored Mary, the mother of Jesus. Well, when he was asked why he was making that move, well, he said that growing up, his wife had a very poor relationship with her father. Consequently, every time in a sermon she heard me talking about God as a loving father, it just never clicked with her. It just kind of reminded her of the childhood and, and the father she had it, that, that, that wasn't there and that she really didn't know. Well, Isaiah tells us that Jesus is the everlasting father. Now, we know in the Trinity or the triune God, Jesus is called God the Son. And yet here, Isaiah points out that in relating to us and his people, he takes on many of those father roles. In fact, one night before Jesus went to the cross, the Bible tells us these words in this next slide. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father in is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. The father-like qualities that a true dad should have are very present and real, and also, my friends, are eternal in Jesus. Think about that. Those eternal father-like qualities that Jesus has are going to be with us in heaven and with us into eternity. Now, I know some of you don't have a very good image of a father. The one uh, that you might have had might not have been much like an everlasting one, but more temporary, perhaps. But you know, Jesus is going to be there forever. He's not going to follow the pattern of brokenness that some fathers have, but he's going to do what fathers are called to do, and that's to love his children. You know, I, I, I heard about a neat bumper sticker this week. It read this in this next slide. God loves you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> well, you know, on one level, that might sound a little proud, but on another level, you know, I think each of us needs to understand that is true for each one of us. Jesus was born for you, and he came for you, for you, the Bible says, the Son of God was given. And as our everlasting Father, He's going to do what fathers are called to do. That's love His children. His love is unconditional. You don't have to earn it. It never ends. And you know, my friends, we can see that love, that faithfulness, as we look in the cross. Well, people say to me sometimes, well, Mike, you know, I hear that all the time, that God loves me. And I've been a Christian. How come I really don't feel that love very much? How come God never seems that close to me? Well, let me just say, my friends, a love relationship is something you have to be involved in. You, you can't have a healthy marriage uh, if you're never there or if you may never make that other person or their desires a priority. And that's true with God. James tells us, draw near unto God, he will draw near unto you. A healthy relationship involves you doing your part. Now, do I always feel, you know, like uh, I have warm feelings and chills running down my back. Oh, I just feel God's love today. You know, not very often. I don't always feel the emotional high of God's love because I'll tell you, emotions come and emotions go. But I will say this. There are times in my life when I have a much greater sense of God's love and his closeness to me. And you know when those times are? Well, one is if I'll go to God each day and I'll make spending the time with him a priority, getting into his word, and taking the time to pray and to worship. Those are times God feels closer, and I have a greater sense of his presence and his love. I've also found that if I'll honor God in my choices and obey him, even when it's tough, especially when it comes at a cost, at those times, I just have a very special sense of God's presence and his love, his, his, his happiness that I'm doing what is right. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And in turn, that opens us up to experiencing his presence. Another time when I 
really sense God's love and his presence is when I'm lonely. If I'm going through difficult times and I don't know what it is, people are praying for me, that's another time that God seems close. Another time where, where God seems real close is if I'm generous to others, especially less fortunate. You know, if, if, if I often sense that if I'm being generous to somebody, giving them my heart, my time, my, my resources, again, I just have a special sense of God's presence and his closeness to me. But the time, I think, when I feel God's presence and God's closeness the most is when I share the gospel with somebody. You know, because when I do that and I tell them about the Savior that loves him, I always walk away with a deeper sense of God's love and his closeness in my heart. Because I'll tell you, my friends, I am sharing with that other person the most important reason why Jesus came. And God just has a way of blessing. And I just have a sense of his closeness and his presence and his love in those times. Because, my friends, he's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. And last of all this morning, the Bible calls him the Prince of Peace. That's the Hebrew word, Sar Shalom. Sar is the Hebrew word for prince. Shalom, of course, is the word for peace. In fact, shalom, that word for peace, has been called the most important word in Hebrew because it not only means peace in a general sense, but something much deeper. Because Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, embodies everything that peace is all about. First of all, Jesus brought peace between us, fallen people, and a holy God. Gordon MacDonald was telling a story one time about a Nigerian woman who was a physician and is teaching at a hospital here in the United States. One day this woman came up to MacDonald after he'd given a lecture. And Gordon writes, this Nigerian woman introduced herself using an American name. What's your African name, I asked. She immediately gave it to me, several syllables long with a musical sound to it. What does that mean, I asked. She replied, it means child who takes the anger away. When I asked and inquired why she would have been given this name, she said, well, my parents had, had been forbidden by their parents to marry. But my parents loved each other so much that they defied the family opinions and married anyway. For several years, they were ostracized from both their families. Then my mother became pregnant with me. One day when those grandparents held me in their arms for the first time, the walls of hostility came down. I became the one who swept the anger away. And that's the name my mother and father gave me. McDonald's writes, McDonald writes, it occurred to me that her name would be a suitable one for Jesus. When Jesus came, he was the child who took the anger away between ourselves and God. God's wrath melted, and our anger at God was over. Through his cross, sin was paid for, and he brought us together. He was the child who takes the anger away, or as we know him, the Prince of Peace. Well, we know, my friends, that on that night, that first Christmas when Jesus was born, the angels came, and they came talking about that peace that Jesus was bringing between God and man. And it says in Luke chapter 2, these words, it says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's the peace. The apostle Paul writes in Colossians 1.20, let's read these words, and by him Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of his blood on the cross. But I tell you, my friends, it gets even better than that. Because the good news is this. Once you have shalom, once you have peace with God, because you've come to the Savior and received him into your life, that's when you can experience in your heart the peace of God. You have peace with God, you experience the peace of God. Because the word shalom has at its root the idea of completeness and wholeness and harmony and fulfillment. And that's what the Prince of Peace brings you. He gives you peace with God. He gives you the peace of God. Wholeness and completeness 
in your heart. Isn't that good news? Well, as we close this morning, let me just ask you, which one of those titles is most important to you? Is it Wonderful Counselor? Is it Mighty God? Is it Everlasting Father? Is it Prince of Peace? Well, what I'd like you to do is take out that J that you were given when you walked in. And I want you this morning to write the title of Jesus that is most meaningful to you today. Is it Wonderful Counselor? Is it Mighty God? Is it Everlasting Father? Is it a Prince of Peace? And then we'd like you to write just a little sentence as to why that title is most meaningful to you this morning. Then what I want you to do is I want you to take this J home with you and hang it somewhere where you can see it this week and remember that quality, that title of Jesus and what it means to you. Hang it from your rearview mirror if you want. Hang it on your mirror in the bathroom. And then as you go through the, your week this week, thank God for that title because he is my friends, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Let's pray today. Our Lord Jesus,